All right, so we are starting again. Partly we have discussed draw texturing and part of some of the essentials of some machines, but we will continue further. And the process parameter which are basically uh, changed because of the draw texturing machines now are also draw friction texturing machines and therefore some of the process parameters may be different. So, we start discussing in the change environment what will be the effect of those process parameters. So, we learnt last time that uh, friction texturing has new challenges like we have to address issues related to broken filaments, tight spots, surging, snow generation, spin finish which may have to be specially designed spin finish and control of denier. Of course, it does offer auto twist control. So, this friction texturing machines which of course, you must remember. Uh, they are also draw texturing machines. So, we are not going to be using a fully drawn yarn, now we are going to be using an POY. And so, there is a POY and you also have friction twisting system. So, we are talking last time about the primary heater, cooling plate, secondary heater, auxiliary equipment. These are some of the things which are essentials of any texturing machines and we did talk about primary heater and we said the primary heater invariably will be convex. The profile could be vertical or horizontal does not matter because the yarn is going to be contacting this heater and it has to be kept under certain tension and therefore, it does not matter whether you are taking the yarn from bottom to top or top to bottom, horizontal or vertical position of a heater. It is based on the convenience and desirability as far as the machine and the space is concerned and we hope that contact heating probably will be more efficient. We did talk about the heater which is the primary heater here also is a twin track kind of a thing. So, you are handling individual yarns, but maybe in one block small block you are having two yarns going together. Obviously, this has to be properly insulated. There is door which is provided after running the machine you can close the door. And the heating generally may be done by the condensation type that there is a fluid inside which evaporates in a space which is there just behind for example, the heater plate. So, that the temperature difference is the least and more uniform heating can take place and that is what it is. So, this is basically your primary heater. So, cooling also we said can be done generally which was initially all machines had the air cooling just the way it is. People then tried because the machine speeds are going to be now increasing. Therefore, the total time available for dissipation of heat also would reduce and therefore, the rate of cooling also had to be changed and so either you force it through liquids like water where the yarn comes in contact. One can always say well I can use for cooling liquid nitrogen which will take fraction of seconds to cool, but would you like to use that? If the yarn comes out of a primary heater and immediately you want to cool because space is what you can reduce. Just purge through a small thing called a, an outlet 
which has liquid nitrogen being purged. It will not take just a fraction of a second, it could cool like, would you like to do that? Because if you actually cool it so much, liquid nitrogen can make any thermoplastic material very rigid because you go much below the room temperature and when you try to do anything with it, untwist, it will only have broken pieces in your hand. So, you still want the yarn to be the way it behaves, just you have to bring down the temperature just below the glass transition temperature and then you can untwist. So, what people found more convenient rather than using water or neither liquid was using a cooling plate, okay, which is also a contact type convex cooling plate. So, heat transfer is quick, machine speed can be increased and then of course, you have a friction twister which runs at a higher RPM and so one can always work around. Then we have secondary heaters also, that is immediately after you have done the untwisting, before winding, for producing yarns which are called the modified stretch yarns, you will have secondary heater. As you can see the shape, the secondary heater is a non-contact type of a heater. It is a tubular non-contact type of a heater. So, one can always say, well, the rate of heating or efficiency of heating may be not as efficient as a contact type but you do not use contact heaters. Why do not we use, why would not like to use a contact heater where the efficiency will be higher? Why would we not like to use? Any response? Because we have to go to the lower temperature. Yarn is already cooled. Yarn is already cooled before it has been untwisted. So, it is maybe, maybe it is not at room temperature, but it is certainly below glass sensor temperature, you know. So, we have to heat it, we have to heat. So, one of the things you can remember is in the secondary heater, we give overfeed and what is the aim? Limited relaxation or limited extension, whatever you want to call it. That means, you want the yarn which otherwise after detwisting may appear under some tension almost uncrimped and you want the crimp to develop here. Although temperature of the heater will be lower than the primary heater, but still morphological changes are expected to happen. But in a condition which is where the filament is not straight, it is relaxed may be not fully relaxed, but it is relaxed. And if you have a relaxed type of environment, how do you contact? If you contact any surface, whatever part of the yarn comes in the contact, that is the only one part of the contact, the rest will be far away. So, then you will be creating lot of non-uniformity, which can be seen at some stage when you after dyeing. And therefore, you do not want the yarn to touch any surface because friction means tension, tension means crimp will be opened also. So, you do not want whatever crimps can be generated in this so called overfeed, they should be allowed to be generated and they would also occupy more space, all right, in the heater. And so, it is a non-contact type. Also, here the yarn path is also an important consideration. Invariably, the yarn will be passed through the heater from top to bottom and not from bottom to top. Similarly, 
this heater will always be vertical and not horizontal. In the primary heater, we say it does not matter, it can be having horizontal, it does not matter. Similarly, cooling plate could be horizontal, could be vertical, could be at any angle, does not really matter because there the yarn is under tension and it is supposed to be in contact with the plate. In this case, yarn is not under tension and you actually want it to relax, to take up some configuration which has to be set in the time period that you have. So, what I said is the yarn path is always top to bottom. Why do we have to have top to bottom? Let me also tell you when the yarn enters, let us say this yarn is entering. So, it may be very straight yarn and this portion, the straight is very straight, but as it goes inside, it will start taking some shape. If you look at the end of the thing, where you will be actually collecting this yarn after the secondary heater, if you measure tension here, it will not be 0. Here there will be tension because whatever over feed you are giving, it is going to be consumed by generation of crimped structure. It may not be very high, but it is not 0. Therefore, you can process, you can take it and do whatever you want to do it, but it will be in a crimped state at this point. And of course, by the time you pick up, it would also have been cooled but no contact cooling here. Cooling in the air that is there, right? because it is again exposed. It is by the time it is picked up, it is still in the form in which the bulk is seen. Right? So, there is no contact cooling, there is no contact heating, the yarn is top to bottom because if you start from bottom to top, when the yarn is not in a crimped form, it will start falling on itself because it has not been heated. The crimp form comes when it gets heated. So, it will just keep collecting at the feed roll itself and then may wrap and break. So, it has to be use the method of gravity, it just falls in and then relaxes. So, enough time of course, has to be given so that you can get a modified stretch yarn. Right, the length of the heater. The length of the heater here could be 1 to 1 and a half meters. So, length could be 1 to 1 and a half meters. Now, try to appreciate that you have a fast running texturizing machine, a primary heater about 2 to 2, 2 meter, 2.25 meters, a cooling plate could be 1 meter, 1.2 meters, 1.5 meters, secondary heater could be 1 meter, 1.5 meters. What is the length of this whole path of yarn? So, it is not like a small machine where you are working, this goes into different floors also. So, the, either it is a very high ceiling kind of environment and then think of somebody who actually finds that he has to or she has to thread the yarn because they are broken. So, start from where, go where, work it out, come down, all type of things become. Therefore, nobody will like any breakage because it is a multifilament you know, yarn industry. And plus, it is complex. So, it is not a small kind of a machine which can be operated. So, then in the modern machines and the friction texturing, draw texturing machines, you will have an oiler roll. Why do we have an oiler roll? Oiler roll is like it applies oil. Why do we need oil roll? Why do we have to apply the oil? 
this Euler roll is just before winding the final package because we mentioned that this friction texturing machine may be using special spin finishes which where the lubricant can evaporate during during the heating process, the primary heater itself because after that you want the friction to be high so that the twist levels are high and so by the time it comes back to the winding stage, we would like to replenish, want to replenish whatever may have been lost. So that is a lubricant which is called oil. All right. And so, an oiler roll, which may be very simple equipment, but attachment, let us say. So, you have an oil and a roll which may be dipping, and the yarn may come in contact with something like a kiss roll technique. If you want more contact, then of course, you can also have more contact. Normally, they will be moving in the same direction as the surface of the roller. You do not want to create friction here, just want to apply. But this technique allows very small amount of liquid to be added up very small amount which is what is required and then it obviously because the surface tension will spread across the whole yarn and you wind it. So, this is going to be a part of machines definitely. These days uh, you may be getting fume extractors. So, why we have fume extractors? Because this so called oil from the spin finish, the lubricant from the spin finish is evaporating now, where will it go? It is in vapor form. So, it will keep coming out of the main uh, primary heater, you extract. If you can condense and use it, use it. If you think you have done lot of damage to this, just above the primary heater, you can have extraction units which will suck the vacuum units of extraction and the well taken to one side. These machines can have noise shields also. The noise level in the pin texturing machine was very high. You can think some part which has got a cut which is cutting the air like the spindle and rotating at 10 raise to 6 rpm. So, that is the kind of frequency which would be generated as far as the noise is concerned. Very shrill, high frequency noise, decibel levels also high and therefore, they had to be protected. So, the noise which can travel by transmission like a motor and a shaft and the noise trans transfers from one end to another. Other is aerodynamic noise that the noise have been generated is actually moving in the air and it is coming to you. This can be shielded by a barrier. If you put a shield, for example, what is happening outside hopefully, we do not hear because of the wall. Similarly, if you put a shield just in front of the noise, the max element which is making the maximum noise, aerodynamic noise can be cut pretty nicely and if it is an absorbent, then it will absorb, otherwise it gets reflected. So, the wave goes and get reflected. So, noise shields could be prepared because if machines are running, 24 7, so many spindle, so many machines in one of the sheds, then you can appreciate the total overall noise. This noise is very different than the noise that you actually are familiar with in a weaving shed, which is very low frequency noise. But the friction texturing machines and the spindles thereof are not rotating at that high speed. The yarn is rotating at high speed, but there is no other element which rotates at that kind of a speed. So, here the noise is of a different kind, lesser thing, but still things are rotating at fast. So, it is better that you have uh, decibel levels which are 70 or less, everybody is safe. 
Automation is a part of every machine, so that's, this is not something which we will see here, whether it is the threading portion, whether it is the contact, whether it is the detection, whether it is temperature control, whether it is speed control. And tomorrow if somebody says, well, as of now, all the spindles are rotating from the main motor through a shaft and the belts, that means the speed of all of them are supposed to be same. Right? So, that is how it becomes the cheapest way of uh, rotating all the spindles, but uh, tomorrow you can think if you think it is an efficient way of working, maybe every individual spindle could have its own motor and so the automation in that sense would be different. That means you can actually control the process parameter for each position, which obviously is more costly, but may be more reliable sometimes. So, one of the profile in which people use these machines is what you see. So, here you are feeding, this is primary heater, this is cooling plate, this is your twister, this is secondary heater. Of course, I have not shown here, but uh, you can always have a spin finish or oiler roll before winding. All right. So, what does it say? It is trying to reduce the height of the machine. So, the operator probably can maybe is here on some platform. and can look at the threading of the primary heater, can look at the top and see the cooling plate. In this case, the yarn would be going below the cooling plate, okay? the yarn would be below the cooling plate, all right? not on top. So, on this side he sees the yarn, on that side he sees the yarn, then there is a twister. If something goes wrong, he sees the twister, I mean this guy height could be a little more. So, you are reducing the height of the whole machine despite primary heater being a longer heater, everything else. So, this is how you reduce the height of the machine. Smart way of adjusting, but the some of the people said, well, you are mishandling the yarn because is bending too many times like the twist has to flow from this power portion and go all the way go all the way down to maybe a nip roll so a long path of course long is there but it is bending what you say this is a very soft material here as it is coming out of the heater this is the twist flow, right? This is not direction of the yarn. Direction of the yarn is this. But the twist is going from the twister downward. Here the twist is more, twist is less, twist is less, twist is less. So, if you bend, the twist flow is going to be affected. Then, here it is still okay because yarn is already cooled. But at this portion, yarn is really hot. So, a hot yarn being, of course, is being twisted. You say we are bending it also. We say this is not the ideal position the yarn should have been handled. So, you say what do you do? The machine becomes too long. Total height may be 1 plus 1 and a half, 2 and a half plus 2, 4 and a half to 5 meters. You are talking about too much if you go straight. So, it did not work but machinery were made by this also. Another profile people thought is let us go all the way. Let us go all the way. There is a platform somewhere where the person may be standing, working around. So, you are only taking all the yarn from whichever on the platform and this is your primary heater. This is the cooling plate this is the twister 
and this is your secondary heater and of course you can have an oiler roll. This is just a depiction, all right. So people have used this profile as well, going all the way straight. So here you can see the threading for the primary heater is from top to bottom in the previous case or bottom to top. But secondary heater in both the cases were always top to bottom. People can use any profile which they think is good enough. But main thing what people wanted is that between primary heater and the twister, the path should be as straight as possible. Then it would be nice, all right. So there will be obviously I have not shown those nip rollers and so on and so forth. There are going to be nip rollers, they are controlling the overfeed and underfeed and everything else which you want to go, the tension control and so on, all the things will be there. So of course, uh, people are handling bigger packages, bigger sizes, that the way, so whole winding zone also is a filament winding, you may remember, this is different than the spun yarn winding, it has to be more precise and so slippages could be more, so those are different kind of winding, so larger sizes handling being done. So that is what about some of the features of the machines. Let us look at the parameters, process parameters. Now we are having a draw texturing friction, draw texturing machine with a friction twister. So the process parameters, we have no problem on the temperature, this has to be there, time with no problem is going to be same thing and we have to worry about it whichever way we want to look at it. And of course, the D by Y, the draw ratio, the tension and angle of wrap are going to be part of this. Let us say we want to now just see whether it is exactly same or different. Effect of temperature on uh, crimp rigidity. What do we think uh, would be the effect on the crimp rigidity? Now we have the change is machine has changed, but let us say we are able to do whatever we are supposed to do and we are measuring crimp rigidity of a yarn with different temperatures. What kind of a curve do we expect? What were we doing? What kind of a curve did we get? in the fully drawn yarn. So the curve for the temperature and crimp rigidity, you got something like this. So obviously theoretically once you find this, you will say okay, well I am not going to go beyond this temperature because what is the point, that is the optimization you will do. But you will get this curve which is similar, we are not talking about the magnitude absolute value of the crimp rigidity, we are just talking about the trend, the trend will be same. Now let us look at the tenacity, remember when we talk about temperature we are obviously talking about heater temperature, right and not any other temperature and let us say we are still in the primary heater and uh, tenacity on one side. What do we expect? Hi? It will go down, right? So this is my parent yarn. Parent yarn tenacity. So we are expecting the tenacity of a textured yarn will be lower, lower than this, right? But it is wrong because here our material has changed. This is a material which can be drawn, it is a draw texturing. So the parent yarn is very weak. If you try to use a parent yarn, it is almost unusable. So what we will feel is that when you increase the temperature, 
obviously drawing will be taking place and temperature will facilitate the drawing also. Draw ratio may be constant, but as the temperature increases, not only the molecules will like to go to whichever position they want, but if you are pulling also, pulling is also easy, right. And so, molecules can get more oriented and therefore, tenacity can increase. So, you may actually see starting from whatever the tenacity that you have in the parent yarn, instead of going down, it may go up and then go down of course. But it will never be able to reach the tenacity of let us say the fully drawn yarn, it will be lower than that. So, that fact still remains, but if you look at our own yarn which is the POY, then you will find the with temperature the tenacity may seem to be increasing and after that all other processes will be there and so you have to again optimize obviously why should you not get to the maximum tenacity or there may be other reason for using a temperature if you are looking at structural uniformity, non-uniformity those could also be the reasons which may actually force you to think differently. Effect of time has a similar effect as far as the temperature is concerned, when temperature is constant and you are increasing the time, if you have zero time let us say theoretically, then your temperature will be also not there, you know, you are not heated at all, temperature is not and so time obviously is important, but let us say within the time that we are looking at optimum time, it can go up and come down, all right, the similar kind of a maximum could be observed with time as well. What people would be interested is, now we have started using a yarn called a POY, does it any way become different, has it actually helped in reducing the time of texturing or does not? But let us say if the POY of polyester which has very low amount of crystallinity, so theoretically you should expect that the time should also change, the time required for optimum, optimum time required for texturing should change. Therefore, people started talking about maybe the rate of setting could be high, so there is a rate, all right, so you understand rate of setting, maybe not, let us say how can we define that. So, when you look at the yarn temperature, this is the kind of profile that you see. So, room temperature is let us say Y naught and yarn temperature let us say is Y and heater temperature is H. So, as the time in the heater, the dwell time in the heater increases, the temperature of the yarn will increase and you would like to go to a time, definitely to a time where the yarn temperature is close to the heater temperature. So, the curve, this type of a curve, if you want to express, can be expressed like this, that the heater temperature and the yarn temperature and yarn initial temperature which is the room temperature can be linked by this type of a first order equation, where the rate of heating which is let us say H here would depend obviously on the heat transfer coefficient which is a polyester, nylon, what kind of material that you have and the desitex or the denier of the yarn and of course, the, the chemistry physics part and the of which means specific heat as well. So, all that will determine the H, but then you can make sure that there is some kind of curve like this. If you know that, then you know how much time it will require to heat, but that does not mean that is the only thing you want. What you want also is that morphological changes also must take place. Just because the yarn has attained a certain temperature does not mean that you have done your job. So, maybe they said that why not measure something like this. I mean, if you are actually working from a zero time, then we expect zero crimp rigidity and let us say under the optimum condition, the maximum possible attainable 
crimpidity is Cm, which is the Cmax, a curve is approximately similar curve, similar looking curve as the temperature curve. If this is so, then you can also probably write an equation like this, where you have R as the rate of setting and uh, C is the crimp contraction or you can also say crimp rigidity and some similar equation can be written like this, which would mean that if you take a derivative, you should be able to get a straight line all right, between the dc by dt and c. And then if you get that, then there is a possibility that you can get the value of r also. So, you can plot dc by dt versus crimp rigidity, which is varying with time. And the plots will look like this and some experiments were therefore done, let us say. So, curves are not really drawn very nicely, but uh, what it was found is that the fully drawn yarn at a temperature in this case, let us say 210 degrees centigrade, all right, this degrees are centigrade, showing different rate, you can appreciate that. And that would probably mean that the time required, maximum time required will also be different. For example, in this case, maybe it is somewhere there, in this case, maybe somewhere here, in this case, maybe somewhere there, in this case, maybe somewhere there. That is the time required to attain an equilibrium kind of a thing would be less. That means you can run the machine faster. So, one thing in this experiment was made clear is that if you have P O Y, which are the top three curves texturized at different temperatures, the one which is at 190 degrees also is giving higher crimp rigidity at lower time. That means using P O Y is always a good idea. Polyester P O Y will be a, the best idea, but if you have to use nylon, it will still be good. That means you can draw the curves which are similar curves where the rate of increase in crimpidity keeps on reducing with time. If you draw the dc by dt versus c, you get straight lines and the slope in some way can give the value of rate of setting. So, what it says is that the rate of setting increases when you are using a POI which means theoretically you can run the machine faster. It is not just the temperature you are talking about now. We are talking about the final property. And if that also is true, so if you compare 210 temperature for a POI and a fully drawn yarn, you say the rate is almost double. So, this is, this is a value, right, as calculated by some experiments and conversions. So, people are happy doing working on POI. If this question is asked that is the rate of setting R constant for a fiber type, let us say nylon, is, is a constant like your specific heat is a constant? We can obviously say it is not constant because based on the temperature, based on the POY, the residual draw ratio of the POY and even denier and so on and so forth, these values will keep changing and therefore, it is not constant. It is only a relative value based on your own material and your own specifications. So, time which was the texturing time now can be reduced and therefore machines can be run faster. Approximately you can think of a material which was running 
would require a fully drawn yarn about 0.3 to 0.4 seconds in a heater, they would require 0.1 second. See other parameter which is the d by y and what the d by y is supposed to do? This is supposed to increase the twist in the yarn. If you increase the d by y ratio, then the twist in the yarn is expected to increase. So, whatever is the effect of the twist in the yarn that should also be seen. So, if you look at and somebody asks what will happen to the kinetic rigidity when you increase d by y ratio. If you increase the d by y ratio, what do you expect to happen to crimp rigidity? Keep increasing d by y ratio. This actually means in some sense you are increasing the twist. So, if you are increasing the twist, what should happen? It should have similar kind of a thing because by increasing the twist keeping other parameters constant, you are increasing the number of helices per unit length and after some time the tension may be more and after if the tension has crossed the barrier then you may start getting the negative thing because relaxation is not happening. So, you will get similar results right. Tenacity we expect the tenacity to fall because it is varying by increasing d by y because draw ratio being same, temperature being same, time being same, only twist being increasing. So, this will only lead to more disorientation and therefore, whatever you want to see will be seen. But more important will be some other characteristics that we just talked about last time. First, let us say we did say that if you increase this, normally we would have expected a straight line, but your twist does not increase. In fact, from the beginning itself there will be some lag and after some time becomes unstable kind of situation. So, the difference between expected value and actual value may change, but the twist is still increasing. It will be very difficult for somebody to tell I am increasing d by y ratio and after some time twist is decreasing, average twist. You think it can decrease? Cannot decrease. So, it will keep on increasing, but if there is more slippage, so stick slip phenomena will be too many and so you will have more and more quality characteristic issues. And so quality becomes an important thing, right. If quality becomes an important thing, so one of the first thing that we should be talking about is let us say the tight spot. Now you know what is a tight spot? So there is a real twist which has been inserted and why it has been inserted? because there must have been some slip. So, if you look at the previous curve and now we want to draw attention and want to see the trend, possible trend of the tight spot and d by y ratio. So, what kind of a trend are we expecting? when we increase the d by y ratio, yes? Will the tight spot increase or decrease? Mm -hmm. Right, so increase in which way? This way, this way. Yeah, which way? Yeah, yes? Second one? Why not third one? Can there be any other trend? Yeah. Is that right? 
So which one do you think is going to be right? One, two, three. Hmm? Three. All right. So let us assume that uh, we believe that the tight spots will increase exponentially because as the speed is increasing, the slippage and instability, instability will keep on increasing as far as the twist and tensions are concerned. More vibration, more slipping, every time you slip, some real twist is going to get inserted and more and more tight spot can form. So you can appreciate that it is going to be one of the most important parameters that somebody would like to control. This can actually change the whole complex complexion of the yarn. That is, this some yarn may be beyond a certain limit, will be absolutely unacceptable. You have nice temperature, you have beautiful time, nice machine, good twister. But you will land up into this. So, there is a portion, there is an area where it is possible that you would be able to control the damage. So, you should know what is the damage control zone. Let us go to the next one the broken filaments. So, the broken filaments with the d by y. We should remember what is a broken filament? Problem. Why does it happen? Right? If you understand this, then we can probably think of the trend. What trend? Third one. This is smart, people have become smarter. I am writing the number third first before anything else because this is the number has come. Is that right? Yep. Why? Because there is a lot of slippage, right? Very good. You're wrong. <laughs> All right, so I am just drawing the trend. And next time when you meet, you talk about the reasons. This curve is like this. Not possible? So, the curve is likely to be this. So, as the thing says that you can now think about it, where we went wrong. All intelligent people, how did we go wrong in assessing the trend. All right, so we stop here and uh, next time we will continue from this place.